Okay, so this is kind of sad. This is our last conversation for Dreamforce, but it is certainly the first of a gazillion on activating solutions for change. So I, I did do a pause. I don't know if you heard the song that was playing right before. It was Sia, um, Unstoppable. And what I say all the time is when purpose <coughs> meets passion, we're unstoppable. And I think that I am thrilled to have a conversation with the most unstoppable badass women um, that I know in this field. So I'm thrilled that we will end the Equality Lounge on this conversation. And of course, then everyone can linger and connect and collaborate after this. Um, but before we start, um, we talk a lot about inclusion and creating inclusive environments. And the best way, and I will cheat sheet this conversation, because I do want to ask you about an inclusive environment, but before we do that, I think inclusivity is you know, really a sense of belonging. That each and every one of us, I know through the three days, knows that this is the place we all belong, no matter where we come from, gender, race, age, mindset, da 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 This is where we all belong. And so, I have to say that it is someone's birthday today. And her name is Kristen. And she is sitting right here. Yay! Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday you. to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kristen. Happy birthday to you. Who gets a birthday like that? Okay, here's my wish for inclusion for this nation and for this world right now. So with that, um, we actually called this something very interesting. We've never done this before. And I actually thought to myself, what does this mean? Diversity is in action. Inclusion is cultural. Um, and then I thought about it. And I actually got some good ideas about that. So I'm excited to have this conversation. I would prefer, instead of me reading a long bio about each of you, because it's just not the feminine way, if you could each in introduce yourself, tell me who you are, what you do, and then, um, I know you got sent questions in advance, but if you don't mind, I'm probably not going to use them because I have a new idea. <laughs> I would prefer you tell me, when was the first time, what was the first moment you actually felt like a woman in the workplace? Mm. It's tough. Hard question. For me, it was easy. Let's, <laughs> let's, okay, let's start down at that end. Great. Hello, everyone. First of all, can I encourage everyone to scoot up? If we're going to be inclusive, why don't you all come up and fill in the front row and make it feel like a family? We just had our little tribe girl powwow right before this. So yeah, come on. Scoot in, scoot in. Don't be shy if you're over here. Come on, take a seat. In the meantime, my name is Savannah Peterson. I'm very excited to be here. I am the founder of Savvy Millennial, where I help the people, products, and brands I want to see grow. A lot of that is around purpose and community building. And I just got off a plane from Auckland, New Zealand about 90 minutes ago. So forgive me if my brain is still processing what day it is and what's going on. I'm, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but great question. So if I'm being completely transparent in this room, I think the moment that I truly felt like a woman in the workplace and like I could wear my skin was the moment that I found out I was a Forbes 30 under 30 and was named to their consumer technology list. Yeah, so that was two years ago. So I guess I've, <laughs> I guess I've only been a woman for two years, <laughs> but it feels really good. Awesome. Well, my name's Janie Yu, uh, partner at Fung Capital. Uh, my work is venture capital, as many other venture capitalists do. I invest in technology startups, but it's a great question. It made me think. Um, Every day, I feel like, well, in the last two years, every day, I feel like a woman in my workplace because I have a two-year-old at home. And you realize being a working mom really makes you feel, gosh, it's so difficult to be a working mom. I literally just came from a poopy diaper change. And after <laughs> that, I barely had time to change. I looked like I was full of poop. And I came here and talk about inclusion. Um, 
But joking aside, being a mom is a wonderful thing. Being a working mom is actually very empowering because you feel like, shit, I can do this. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's literal S H I T, but oftentimes it's, it's you know I can look after a kid, I can manage the family, I can also invest in companies and make money for my investors, and invest in great businesses. Um, the the time when I feel I was actually a, wom a woman, this has actually made me angry. And uh, when I'm angry, I, uh, uh, I, I get very passionate about this. I actually very much voiced it this. A couple weeks ago, I was in Hong Kong. And uh, I have two great partners, two guys. My partners were invited to play golf. Mm by a, a local Hong Kong, a very wealthy businessman. And I was not invited. And that made me very angry. My gender was never in play in my work. That's the moment wh when I realized I am a woman and I need to do something about this, right? A in the past, it's all about investing in great businesses. Gender doesn't matter for me. Mm -hmm. I've invested in female CEOs. I've invested in great businesses led by female leaders, but that was, n that was never really uh, uh, intentional. And now you feel like, I actually need to be more intentional about this because people obviously see me as a woman in my workplace. And you know, as a community, as an individual, I need to do something about this, which is why, um, Despite the fact I had to manage poopy diaper, I am here today. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you for sharing that. Amazing. Hi, my name is Ari Horier, uh, founder and CEO of a women's startup lab. Uh, we have a house uh, in this Bay Area where we gather a female entrepreneur around the world and we have them go through immersive uh, tech startup uh, accelerator. And um, you know, throughout my life, I never really paid attention if I was treated differently. Just focusing on things I have to get it done. Maybe I sense some discrimination, maybe, but it just never accepted. But then, when I started Women's Startup Lab, I knew there were differences, there were challenges. But many of the mentors that who have gone through, you know, ahead of us and paved the path really taught me all the challenges the woman went through from statistics to the women's study and the history. And that's the time I truly appreciate what we have done. We're the, the most brave uh, gender in some way, not strength, but uh, mentally and how much we move the world and uh, sacrifice ourselves for the other human being. And so I, I remember just about four years ago, there's something open up that I, I couldn't close or deny it a profound awareness of how much women have done. And I think since then, I'm a lot more aware. And I was one of those young women who used to look at the older people and say, what's wrong with those older, bitter women? I never want to be like them. That's what I used to say, because I wasn't aware. And I'm in the position, and I get it when young people say it. I embrace them. I love them, who they are. And I think we have a generation ahead to make things almost seamless. Hopefully, we can do that but also um, knowing more that allowed me to really feel um, deeply appreciative about being a woman. So, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Hauser. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I made a film called Code Debugging the Gender Gap, and I'm now making a film called Bias, which is about unconscious bias. And it's funny, Shelley, when you asked that question, um, and then I heard Savannah's answer, I thought, oh wait, I've got to think of a positive time. <laughs> Because honestly, the first time that, that came to me, the very first time I realized that I was a woman in the workplace um, was in 1988 when I was working at the corporate headquarters of William Sonoma. Great company, nothing about the company because I think this would happen anywhere, but I was encouraged to, I just wanted to get out of the job that I had. I was an administrative assistant for the head of merchandising and um, had just graduated from Cal Berkeley and I wanted to move up. And so there was an interesting position um, open in sort of the real estate section. And there were just two men that were running this very small department. So I walked in and I said, um, I'd like to apply for the position. And the guy said to me, shut the door. And he said, come on in, shut the door. And I shut the door and he said, I could never work that close to you. <gasps> and I was 20 something, I said, why? What do you mean? <laughs> do I smell? <laughs> um, and he said, I just couldn't do it. I can't work that close with you. 
And I left confused and sat down at my desk, and it wasn't until I talked to a couple of friends about it that they were like, well, Robin, duh, you know. And, but I, it really bothered me for a long time. Of course, I didn't say anything to anybody about it, but um, that's the first time I thought, wow, this is going to be different for me, or for any woman. You know, it really is amazing. I, you know, with hashtag me too, I said if there was a girls' lounge then, um, th women would have felt very comfortable because a woman alone is power collectively. We have impact. And look at us here talking about, you know, what's on our mind because we know we're going to work together to activate change. So I wish I was in your life in 1988 um, so that we could have dipped it in the bud at that time. So. Yeah, I wish I'd been me now then. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we are us now exactly. for the new then. Exactly. So that is why this is uh, our, our new opportunity, really, and our legacy um, at this moment in time. Kristen. Um, so my name is Kristen Hayden, and I'm the uh, chief partnership officer for Ignite. Ignite is a national organization and a movement that is inspiring and equipping, equipping the next generation of young women to run for political office. Yeah. Speaking of next generation, um, I mean, I think that's, that's really motivating for me to, to work with young people because all the things that we're talking about, um, if, you know, you can't go back to the past, but what you can do actively right now um, is how can you make this world a better place for the young women that are, that are stepping into their power. And when you ask that question, the first, um, I like, by the way, when you go off the script, <laughs> do that, please. Just, I don't know how to go any Speak other from the heart. You keep getting me, so these are great, but then I feel you all in a different direction, so that's why I got that. Yep, that's your, that's your wisdom. And uh, my, the first thing that came into my mind was um, when I was, um, in my early 20s, uh, my mentor, again, in, the, in thinking about the importance of your male mentors and sponsors, um, sent me to um, the former Soviet Union to, I was like 22 years old, to run, he had a bunch of investments in the Republic of Georgia, of all places, and um, sent me to represent his company and all of his investments there. So I'm 22, I'm 22, <laughs> I'm young. <laughs> I um, really did not necessarily have that experience to be in that, but he believed in me, and um, I did speak Russian. That helped. Um, and I. How many languages, just out of curiosity, do you speak? Three. Okay. Which but one? The Russian. Well, I speak Russian really well. I understand French and a little Japanese, but of you Russian don't. is. English. And English. And English. Oh yeah. Four. Okay. But um, anyway, I just that that was it's very machismo culture over there. Um, I mean, it is in many places of the world, but really in the Republic of Georgia. It is. And so for me to be this young woman, I, I felt like I had three things against me, that, um, that I was young, they really had a problem with that, that I was in charge, and um, that I was a woman, definitely, that was like, they could not understand again. And then thirdly, that I also don't fit the stereotype of the typical feminine woman. So that, those three things, I just felt they were always looking at me like, God, why do we have to put up with you? And um, to the power of um, a, you know, a sponsor, um, every time they tried to, to basically minimize me or, and um, not, you know, didn't want to work closely with me, my, um, my sponsor mentor from abroad really gave them the message like, she's the decision maker, like, that's why I put her there. And so that, that, I mean, they, they couldn't get around it because of that. They respected him so much that through that they were transferred. But they were they were challenged to work with me. They didn't. They'd never seen anything like it. And then you killed it. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> uh, I'm Sally Krawcheck. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Elevest, a business I did not think needed to exist. It is a digital investing and planning platform for women. Um, a few years ago, I recognized after having spent my career on Wall Street that we have, we all know about the gender pay gap, but there's a gender investing gap. We don't invest as much as the men do. It costs the women in this room, the women in this room probably a million plus at least over the course of our lives. For some women, it costs us more than the gender pay gap. Um, and so it's life changing. And it's not our fault. Investing as it is today was um, created by men and therefore does a better job of serving men. Um, and uh, yeah. Oh, 
and we're not going to be fully equal with men until we have as much money as they do. So that's my whole thing. Um, so I guess the first time, you know, for years and years and years, I worked on Wall Street, and I was really one of the guys for most of that time. Um, I fit in with them. I was at senior levels with them. Um, and really, Did you I golf think with them too. No, mm -mm. Okay. no, I'm not a golfer. Um, but I, you know, I joked with them. I went to the, you know, talk, talk basketball with them the whole thing. I really, and I, by the way, I love men. I have been married to a couple of them. I just think they're <laughs> just like so amazing. I'm probably married to the whitest man on the planet that you will ever, ever meet. Uh, but the first time I, I felt, really felt my femininity um, in the office was in the crisis of 07, 08. I was running Smith Barney at the time. We just had, saying. Yeah, just saying. Uh, we had missold investment products to our clients. We had sold them as low risk, go down eight cents on the dollar in a bad market. They weren't. We made a mistake. They went down 100 cents on the dollar. And I went to my brand new boss, Vikram Pandit, and said, hi, I'm Sally Krawcheck. I, I work for you. And uh, I'd like to partially reimburse our clients. And he said no, and I said yes, and he said no. And we went back and forth for quite a while. It was called up to the board, and we took the debate to the board. Um, I was saying earlier today, pro tip, if you ever debate, you ever go up against your boss at the board level, you will be fired. And we, I actually won the fight. We partially reimbursed clients, but I was fired. Now, what does that have to do with being a female? For years, I thought sort of nothing. But as I did more and more research, because I'm a recovering research analyst, the research tells us that we women can, in some ways, be different from the guys. And I was the only woman um, on the senior leadership team, one of the few women in a senior leadership position on Wall Street, the only executive to reimburse clients. And the reason I did it were what the research tells me are fundamentally female reasons. I was completely focused on the relationship. I was completely focused on the long-term health of the business, not the short-term. And I was completely focused on a sense of fairness overall. And though the, I was literally, literally told by the henchmen around my boss to sit down and shut up. And it was the first time I thought, I'm not sitting down and shutting up about anything. I'm going to see this way through, even though, of course, as you might imagine, it was a very, very, very expensive choice for me. I'm never speechless. I am so blown away because I was sitting here thinking I was the only female CEO in the top 25, and I don't talk about the female but the feminine because there's men that exhibit feminine qualities, which are exactly what you talked about. We don't do deals. We develop relationships. Mm -hmm. It is about nurturing, collaboration, not competition, um, empathy, which I think are some of the greatest qualities of leadership today to succeed. And, and then I started thinking about Melissa Arnault, and I don't know if any of you know. Does anyone know who she is, Melissa Arnault? Melissa Arnault is the only female Sherpa on Mount Everest. And she never got chosen to take anybody on tours because they're all men. People always chose the men. Why? Because they're the strongest physically, you know, quote, unquote, until there was a Sally moment mm -hmm. where there was an accident on mm -hmm. Mount Everest. And who saved the day? Melissa Arnault. With what talent? Her feminine qualities of empathy and nurturing mm -hmm. and collaboration and not about the physical, but it was her mental strength that saved them and no one died mm -hmm. on that mountain where it could have been a fiasco. What happened as a result? Melissa is the number one Sherpa on Mount Everest today as a result. So I had no intention of telling the story, except that you inspired me to share that because it was the feminine qualities of strength that got us to that place. So I say if we all get this and we've all seen the data, if we close the gender, the wage gap, we can see $28 trillion to the global GDP by 2025. If we keep going down the pace we're going, it'll take over 118 years to see parity in the C-suite. Go on and on and on. We all know that diversity is good for business. So today it says diversity is in action. Why is it, especially in investing, 30 under 30, investments, uh, why don't women, you know, we know that women have power to do amazing things. And the Shark Tank guy says that the companies run by women outperform they the do. companies run by men. So why, 
do female entrepreneurs have a hard time getting money from investors? Like, why is this a challenge? Well, well, we know this, right? Because people love to do business with themselves. It is so much more comfortable <laughs> to do business with, whether you're at a big company, a VC, et cetera, to hang out with people like yourselves. And it's despite not just some evidence to the contrary, massive amounts of evidence to the contrary, right? That when you have diverse leadership teams, higher returns, lower risk, greater innovation, greater client engagement, greater employee engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody in this room think it is a coincidence that the trading floors of Wall Street are 90% men. There is research that correlates testosterone levels with poor risk taking. Anybody think that is a coincidence to the financial crisis? Anybody think that we would have had a more severe financial crisis if we had more women? Of course not, right? We all know it, but even when it's that important, the health of the US and global economy, you know what's happened to diversity on Wall Street since the crisis? It's gone backwards. It's gone backwards, right? And so the power of I just want to be with people like me is so great. And so, you know, four or five years ago, right when we were gearing up to have our first, you know, you know, getting ready to get ready to have our first female president, you know, we were all leaning in and, and we could all do this ourselves and we could all push forward and we were going to take over. And then we, meet, we met middle management, right? You know, I don't think we talk nearly enough about the impact on all of us of having a bad boss. You know, Todd, the guy who just doesn't get it. And we, we sort of vest the responsibility back into us. You know, you can do it, girl, but what if I work for Todd? Then you got a problem. And that's why I think investing, that's why I put my stake in the ground on investing. Because it is, so, you know, I hear it sometimes and it just infuriates me. I'll talk about the gender investing gap and some dope reporter um, we'll say, well, yeah, but the real issue is the gender pay gap. There's no real issue. You know, that's like saying I've got a broken leg and a broken arm. I'll wait till I fix my leg till I fix my arm. The thing about investing, the reason I'm putting my stake in the ground is it's something we can do, right? We don't wait. We don't have to wait for Todd. We can do it today. I just felt a little passionate there for a minute. I, I'd like to do a blog that says don't work for Todd. That's my next blog. <laughs> Don't work for Todd. But that, you know, we never Todd. talk about that, right? I know. Because we're so relationship oriented. We're all like, if I could just, you know, I remember working for a really bad boss um, who fired me eventually, but even though my results were better than, any, than anybody else. And I remember like, how can, how can I serve up a report that works better for you? And at my heart, like there was nothing I could do. I'm going to shut up. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting what Sally's talking about is like me bias. And it's a real thing. And women have it too, by the way. We all have it. We feel more comfortable yeah. with people that are like us, that grew up where we grew up, that went to our colleges and everything. It's the easy thing to do. Yeah. And the problem with venture capital is that the truth is, no offense to anybody, but they're not really that creative. They are pattern matching. So they're just looking to <laughs> pattern match exactly what's made them money in the past so that they continue to try to make money that way. And as long as they're pattern matching, women, don't, women entrepreneurs don't fit the pattern. I think absolutely. there's absolutely, as a venture capitalist on this panel, there's, uh, um, there's a lot of truth to that statement that a lot of it is about pattern matching, right? Um, there's one other issue. There's literally not enough of a pipeline in female entrepreneurs. And that's because mm. of the, everything we just talked about, right? I actually recently did a literal, a literal counting of the deals that I look at. I look at average about 2,000 deals a year, right? less than 15% of that is actually led by a female entrepreneur. So that you know, trickles down to my investment por portfolio as well. Out of 15%, I can choose you know, a couple of them to invest. But you literally, you, you ended up investing in more guys. And, and part of that is because, because it's about, I want to invest in people I know. A lot of female entrepreneurs don't e literally, you know, they, they don't think it's worth their while to go through this route because it's really fucking difficult. And and as a result, you know, I, I think unless the pipeline issue is <coughs> fixed, <coughs> it's actually really hard to fix the larger industry when it comes to venture capital. Venture capital has a really bad reputation when it comes to diversity and comes to supporting women, right? But I think there's actually a lot of desire to do that, myself included. I think a lot of uh, female colleagues of mine actually really want to do something about it. But we have to fix the pipeline issue first before we are able to support more female entrepreneurs. 
Uh, okay, I, I'm gonna, let's go in order, because I know this has raised a lot of, I can feel yeah. this energy of everyone ready to pounce in an interesting way, so we're going to. Kristen, go ahead. Yeah, I love that you're talking about pipeline, because uh, the work of Ignite is all about getting more young women in the pipeline for politics, and everything that we're talking about, I'm hearing through the lens of politics, it's the same thing around getting more women at the decision makers table and the same, and what you were saying, Shelley, is, um, you know, women, it, it, all the research shows are more collaborative. I mean, look at what's going on in our government right now. You have more women in office. They are more likely to reach across the aisle. They were the ones when the government almost shut down. It was all the women that came together, Republican and Democrats, to, to, to solve that. So that is a fact that shows. But again, back to the pipeline. I mean, we can all talk about the problems, but I also, and I know, Shelley, you care passionately about this too, about moving to solutions. So what are we gonna do about it? I mean, yes, we have a pipeline problem. That's why we're trying to encourage more young women to run for office. They also don't wanna get into it for similar re reasons. The good news is, I'm all about looking at the silver lining, right? There is a shift happening. This is the difference what you were saying about diversity and inclusion. Inclusion is a culture versus just like the numbers. And I think there is, I mean, we are going, we've been going, we're going through a rough time right now, <laughs> yeah. to put it mildly, yeah. in so many ways, in so many industries, like, and globally, okay? So the pain is there, it's real, across the board. And things aren't changing, things aren't changing, have not, they've flatlined in politics, they've flatlined and gone backwards, as you've said. Um, the good news is that there is a, it, I, we're, I think we're hitting that fed up moment and um, there, there is a shift in culture that's happening, which even allowed the whole Me Too um, thing to arise. And it's, and, it's, and it's spreading all over industries. And again, I try to look at the positive, I think, and it, it is this younger generation, it is the people that are already embedded that starting for the first time to speak their voice, but then th that are inspiring the, the young ones to come to step into that. So we, I do think we're in a shift. It's bad, it's really bad and ugly out there, but the good news is that there's a, it's, 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 it's created a moment. Okay, so let's go to Savannah, and then I wanna go to Sally, because I know I wanna, the pipeline conversation, I'm not so sure I agree with the pipeline as much as, you know, we all have choices in certain ways, and I think there is a much fatter pipeline than we're, you know, acknowledging, but let's go to Savannah. Yes. And then, uh, okay, go ahead, because I see you coming That's, out of your This chair. was perfect, though. Everyone's leading into each other beautifully. Nice work, ladies. <laughs> I think but it started with ta tattoo comparing, where <laughs> we were all sharing, I don't have a tattoo, but now I want one, all of our tattoos. <laughs> so Hers is so much better than mine. I've <laughs> got tattoo you're, jealousy. You're just getting started. Yeah. It, you, yeah. yeah. So for the record, <laughs> me too. It's, it's going to be part two. Yeah, just for the record, me too. If anyone's feeling it in that room, or in this room rather, I'm sure we're all in that camp, especially in our industries. I think what we're all getting and kind of getting closer to is accountability. And we're seeing it happen now as a society. We're holding people accountable. And I think that we need to be holding our peers accountable. Men need to hold each other accountable. Women need to hold each other accountable. We need to hold each other accountable. Transgender, cisgender, doesn't matter what it is. The studies show that it's gender balance that is success. It's gender balanced teams that are more creative, that share more knowledge, that effectively get more tasks done and get investors greater return on their investment. And so if we all celebrate the teams and we say, hey, are you recruiting a balanced board? I know you're starting a new company. Or you know, how are you, how's your engineering team or how's your design team looking? And, and really it starts at the top. It really does start from a board level. It starts from the C-suite. And if you're thinking about becoming a founder, start thinking about diversity and inclusivity and celebrating that balance in the companies that you see and calling attention to that on social media and in your networks and, and even within those organizations. Yeah, so um, I, I love that comment, and I'll say that that's how we started Elevest, that diversity is a priority for us because of how it drives, because we're good people, we want to give everybody great opportunities, but because of how it drives business results. And so I hear again and again, you know, we can't find any women engineers and we can't find any people of color. Blah, 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 blah. We are today, our, our engineering and product group is 50% women. Our company is a third individuals of color. You can do it, and I'll tell you how to do it. If you have a company with a strong mission, they're coming to us. 
because they want to be part of something that isn't just a paycheck. Back to the pipeline issue, I think I can help you on that because I have also am the owner of Elevate Network, um, which for those of you on the East Coast might remember as the old 85 Broads. Um, we are now uh, close to 100,000 women strong and it's full of entrepreneurs. And I tell you, the problem is there, it isn't there aren't female entrepreneurs out there. They don't know how to connect to getting f sources of funding. And so when someone like First Round Capital came to New York and said, Sally, can you set me up with some entrepreneurs? It was friggin' overwhelming demand. There are so many of them out there with such terrific ideas. It's a matter, I, I don't think it's a pipeline. I think it's a matter of just connecting the dots for these individuals. I always have a problem um, shifting topics and I think I, the pipeline thing drives me crazy. Probably because I've heard it for way too long. And so a couple of years ago, I'll go back to my industry, Wall Street, the New York Times called me and said, Sally, exciting news, we'd like a quote from you, which is this year, the investment banking classes on Wall Street are third women. So the pipeline is filling up. And I said, that's amazing, because in 1987, when I went to Wall Street, my investment banking class was a third women. <laughs> the problem wasn't the pipeline. The problem is they wouldn't promote us. I was on Bloomberg not so long ago with a portfolio manager, again, in the investing industry. And we, of course, we were talking about women and business. And, and uh, um, Tom Keene, who I adore, who's about, is this being live streamed or, streamed or anything? No. He's like 150 years old. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, he turned to me and said, could we just begin to talk about this issue of women in business without being so, sh you know, so emotional and shrill about it? I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me because I think we're being really quite reasonable and we've made no progress. But the portfolio manager sitting next to me did one of these, oh, we love women. Their work is so good. They are so strong. It's so thorough. They turn it in on time. We just can't keep them. And on live TV... I turned him, I couldn't help myself, and I said, have you thought about promoting them? And like his jaw dropped because of course we don't want to promote them. We just want them cute and fuzzy, you know, cute and adorable over here, doing their little junior work. You know, listen, I think- It's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? The truth is truth has to, we have to start, and it's, it's not just about each other's responsibilities. I think that it is about each and every one of our own response. It starts with me. It starts with yeah. you and you and you. With each of us saying, I can be better, I will be better, and this is what I'm going to do. So I would love to go back around in any order, so you have time to decide how you want to jump in. How do you believe or what are you doing to make a difference so that we can stop having this conversation and start activating change. Give me one thing you're committing to yourself or you already are doing that is going to drive this conversation from admiring the problem to activating solutions for change. Give me something. This is great. So this New Zealand thing is going to come in handy right now. I wasn't expecting it, but I'm starting to feel the jet lag. So down in New Zealand, and I think it's kind of a commonwealth thing, they have what's called tall poppy syndrome. Anyone heard of tall poppy syndrome? Kind of know what I'm talking about. So the idea behind tall poppy syndrome is when people rise up, when the poppy blooms above the grass, the mower comes and takes it down. So the culture is very humble and people are nervous about rising up and, and, and leading because they're afraid of getting cut down because the media culture is kind of like that, their friends are kind of like that. And so what I do personally, both down there and up here is try and eliminate tall poppy syndrome to encourage everyone to, to support their friends, to be proud of your, I call it my nest, but to have your network of people that are gonna empower you, that like we're a nest now, which is awesome, uh, that all of us, not just this panel, and, um, and really uh, it, look in the face of someone, whether you know them, or they're an audience member, or they're someone that you're mentoring or working with, and tell them that you believe in them, and that they can do it, and that they will do it. And even though it's really fucking hard, all the time, <laughs> let's be real, uh, 
that they are empowered to do it and that you believe in them. Because it sounds cheesy, but I work with a lot of kids and people don't hear that enough. And I mean, I think even when you're successful and I think even as you, especially as you become successful, less and less people say that because it becomes assumed. Oh, you're this, so I, you're fine. Like, people think I'm a multimillionaire because I'm a 30 under 30. It was Forbes, not Fortune. Totally different thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we love Forbes, though. Yeah, oh, totally, totally. Love. Nothing but love. Shout out to Myra. Yeah, yeah. So, so really, I, focus on uplifting everyone and those people you know are, are fighting that battle. And, and even if that person isn't ready to advocate for themselves, in the workplace, be an advocate for the people around you who are minorities, so we can be balanced. For the Olympics, we called it the shine theory. So you call it the poppy syndrome. Mm -hmm. This was the shine theory. You help people rise and we all shine. So yeah. very similar. And you have a sunshine on your wrist. So there you have it. Named after Sally's daughter. So let's let the sun shine. Okay. Well, the easiest thing for me to do is to get access to the 100,000 women that Sally's working with. That Done. Will be, that will be easy. Right? But Done. I will say, we're, t we're here to talk about gender, right? But ultimately, I do believe inclusion is a culture. And inclusion is not just about bringing women and giving women the opportunity they deserve. It's an important part of it. It's also, at the end of the day, I believe it's about believing in the best of people. And being a good leader, you want to grow people, grow the team, and very much along the same line you're talking about. Um, on our team, you know, I have um, younger men. I have older men, younger women, older women that are working together. And there are many things that, you know, that they do that they're probably not at the, quite at the, you know, partnership level. But you want to include them because these people can grow as well. So one simple thing I do in my work every day is for partnership meeting, I always bring the team members in. For important meeting I'm taking, I'm always bringing another team member into the meeting. Because only do they look when, like you, or do you bring? They don't. They look different, many different ways. Do you consciously try to bring diversity into your meetings? I'm not very conscious. I'm always trying to bring somebody, somebody who deserves that opportunity. It doesn't matter their gender, the, the color of their skin, right? If they deserve that opportunity, that will be very impactful for their career. I bring them into the meeting. So I think it's something you have to put into practice to include them in these things where they can learn, and that becomes the culture. It's not a policy, it's not a number, uh, it's just something that you practice every day, it's a habit. So um, for me, we have group of influence in Silicon Valley, we went at it over and over, what is the real problem? What you think at the surface, there's a much deeper problem. And at my work with the Women's Startup Lab, we know there's money, and certainly money is really important, like she's talking about. And But the truth is, women don't get to be the level where the investor say, I'm so dying to give it to you, because a startup is so hard. There's always, you might be so good at this part, you might get traction, but you might not be doing this part. So there's always more to, to ponder on and improve. And I really think that before you even get there, there's just so much reason the women fall out. And at Women's Startup Lab, we really focusing on the, the tribe that you talk about. We have this Japanese, originally from China, and uh, it's called Hito, means a two-stroke leaning on each other, means human. So we really bring influencers here in the Silicon Valley, know our mission, and two weeks of residential really t uh, bring them together. So the female entrepreneur, the female entrepreneur, leave our program saying this was a life-changing experience. And they go on supporting each other. And the influencer isn't there to just talk during the two weeks about investment only, but they actually take on a lifelong possibility of mentoring them. And those are the super influencer that when they open up their Rolodex, I don't know if there's such a thing that exists anymore, but from there, they just have a series of intro, on and on and on. So it's not just here, uh, kumbaya, women get together and just let's do the network. We really try to go, our strategies go deeper. So when you leave, you have something that you can uh, treasure on and support each other uh, the rest of your life. That's how we try to also support in the whole entire ecosystem, besides lots of money. So. Well, I suppose the easy thing for me to say is that I make films about these issues. Um, but you're amazing, by the way. Everyone should see 
all of Robin's films. Well, that's nice of you to say thank you. I'm not I nice, <laughs> I'm honest. Um, I hire a lot of women. Predominantly, my, my production team is women, not all, but predominantly. But I'm beginning to be concerned about the fact that in a lot of women's movements, especially in feminism, traditional feminism, um, that, and I don't like the term people of color, so I'm gonna use it, but I guess then I'm pink. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, that, that non-Caucasian women weren't included in that. And that, yeah. that was an awakening to me, and it was shocking and humbling, and I really think that it's important that we start to I think the new term is womanist, and that womanism includes non-Caucasian women, and to me that's incredibly important. So I feel like now my work is discovering some of my own unconscious biases and really trying to have inclusiv inclusivity and diversity in terms of um, however I can bring in women that are non-Caucasian non as well and not to discriminate against Caucasian women, to, but to really make an effort to bring in people of color. I just have to say, something bothered me recently, and of course when I'm bothered I have to say something and do something about it, and it was a girls' lounge actually in, in the, at the 4As, an agency you know, group of women, and I was in an elevator with a, um, a, a woman of color, a, a black woman, and we, she didn't know who I was. We both were walking into the girls' lounge, and of course I walked in, and she peeked in, and she left. And there were hundreds of women in there, and so I went after her, and I'm like, where are you going? She said, there's no one like me in there. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, what do you mean? We're all women. And I said, you mean there's no black women in there? Is that what you're saying? And she said, yes. I said, so why are you leaving? I said, it's not my response. I said, we're a reflection of the color of this industry. If there's your other girlfriends that are all black, go get them and bring them here and change the color. That's up to you too. It is all of our responsibility. And I said, it's not just mine. I said, go recruit all your friends. I said, and I will help you. Everyone is welcome here. And it is a womanist issue, mm -hmm. just to tie it. And I got really pissed that it, she's leaving it to be my problem, you know, that we have this issue. And I said, go get your ass back out in the conference, go find you know, other black women, bring them up here, and in the future, you're now the new ambassador, and you know, start encouraging them. Well, that was four years ago. She's now our number one you know, fan, bringing more and more you know, women of color in. But we are a collective, and yes, she has two strikes against her. Women of one gets paid 79 cents on the dollar, a black woman gets paid 74 cents on the dollar, and an Asian woman or a Hispanic woman gets paid 72 cents on the dollar, three strikes. But we all are womanists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, I do think I'm just going to push back a teeny, teeny bit there, and I do think that it takes an effort on our part, too. 100%. Because, yeah, because I, I think that historically, um, a black woman might not have felt comfortable in this room uh, at a, you know, Dreamforce. And, and so I think that, and, and that has nothing to do with you, right? You're trying to include everybody. This has more to do with the tech industry. So I think that... Um, but it doesn't, Robin. It's not that... It was, it was a reflection, but... Our response, I created a lounge for everyone. Everyone was invited and everyone was welcome. And so just deciding that you don't think you'll be welcome is a mindset. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So no, it I, does start with all of us knowing we're in this together. Exactly. I think it takes, right, exactly, from both sides. And, and them understanding that they're included. I think it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I agree. I'm struggling with it, too. On that note, um, I have felt very welcomed by Shelly and the Girls' Lounge, which is now the Equality Lounge. I'll just tell you straight up, I don't see a lot of people that look like me at the Girls' Lounge. I mean, we've talked about this, the, what society said masculine facing, this is what a label that I've been slapped on. Um, gay woman, I don't see a lot of that at the Girls' Lounge, but I, I feel super welcome and I um, actually all about, yeah, let's, Bring in some, let's bring in more. Um, but it's a, it's this fine balance of, um, I think, one feeling, I mean, that's why I say I don't see my reflection, but I'm used to not seeing my reflection in a lot of places. And then also deciding intentionally that I, you know, I, I want to blaze a path for, for other people. And again, I think that's been all over. But I, I, but it's like it's a, it's a dance of of two. I, I want to say for the thing that I want to take on to do differently, and, and we find this in politics as well around getting more women of color, and also in the nonpartisan work that we do, 
um, it's the statistics are three to one. They're um, Democrat to uh, Republican women. So intentionally getting more, making sure that in all of the events and the mentors that we pair them up with our young women that we are, you know, consciously, we, we really have to make an effort. It would be, in, you know, we saw this at the women's marches and stuff, not only very white, but very left-leaning. And how do, how do we create a space in the work that we're doing that also embraces uh, more conservative uh, perspective? So that's something that I'm constantly working with very presently now. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't feel, it's not autopilot. The autopilot is back to what you're saying, is to hang out with people that think like you and look like you. That's the autopilot. I feel like it's, a, it's, a, it's actually about being present. I catch myself pretty much every day where I'm in moments where I know it's more comfortable. And I, I, I again, for me, it's, it's about being present to be like, ooh, this, is, this would be a lot easier just to do this or just to work with these people, but <sighs> deep breath, you know, like it takes intentionality. It, it actually takes intentionality to do that differently. And when I've been, in, to your point, in, invited to be an advisor on company, uh, people invite me to be, uh, you know, an advisor or an investor in company, I ask that question, well, what's the makeup, the balance? And sometimes people are surprised. I say, I want to be a part of something. Okay, if it's not there now, are you committed to, for, so for me to be a part of this, are you committed? Yeah. And, and let's set a date. Mm -hmm. Let's not keep it vague. Let's, uh, by when are we going to have balance? Okay, great. So that's, that's a action. I think it's also diversity is about action. If we want diversity, we should all be going out there and bringing three people not like us. Mm -hmm intentionally going after, and I do, I go, and I make new friends all the time. I don't care who they are. I want, you know, to bring three people not like me, and that's the action. And then the inclusivity is to make sure that everyone feels included in everything we do, and that each individual feels the sense of belonging, regardless of gender, race, age, political, you know, um, perspective or, you know, sexual, you know, uh, acclivity, whatever it is, everyone should feel that they belong no matter what. I think that really is the goal. Sally. Yeah. Um, I love what you said about, you know, how, f where are you going? And if you're not there, how fast are you going to get there? Um, I think it's so important for all of us to start to call BS on some of these companies that, you know, we'll put out advertising or make public statements about their inclusivity or their diversity and don't back it up. Um, so I'm, I'm giggling a little bit because, you know, the fearless girl in Manhattan, which is such a wonderful symbol, uh, the company that put it there um, is in, you know, with regards to financial services, about the middle of the pack when it comes to the percent of women on their board. Um, pretty not great when it comes to the women in their leadership team. The product that they are advertising through this fearless girl, the she index that invests in the top companies for advancing women, they don't even qualify to be included in their own product. And so I call BS on it. And uh, they, you know, send me this email. We want to come talk. You know, it's very nuanced. We want to come talk to you. I said, I don't have time. You know, I don't have time for this. I do your nuanced, you know, ex reasoning. Um, just, just friggin' promote them. Right? Just, you know, forget the friggin' diverse slate. Forget the women's initiative that's been in place for 20 years um, that hasn't helped you and just promote them. Um, and it has to come, I think, from a CEO level uh, in order to help individuals in middle management overcome that inherent bias. But anyway, what am I doing besides calling BS? You know, I'm spending my life on this now. Um, I really believe that I had, I was so fortunate to have such a, an amazing career that I never expected with plenty of ups and downs that when I recognize there is this gender investing gap, and to be quite frank, there's so few women in senior levels in finance and there's so few women in senior levels in, in tech that I looked around and said, if I don't work on this, I don't know who else is gonna do it. And so at an age at which, you know, I'm not 23 anymore, when so many of my friends were, I'm going to do board work, I'm going to do whatever, I said, nope, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go out and raise venture capital money, surround myself with, you know, 
older people who, you know, where we need the experience, such as a chief investment officer or the chief compliance officer, but bring in a whole bunch of young people so that we can have the innovative spark and do something that, you know, I didn't think I'd be doing at this age, raising money and, and starting a company from scratch. Um, I'd ask you all to take a look at it. It's Ellevest, E-L-L-E-V-E-S-T dot com. Um, take a spin around it. You can get to me. I'm Sally, S-A-L-L-I-E, at Ellevest.com, and give me feedback. Uh, because what we've done so far is that rather than me saying, oh, I'm a woman and I'm in finance, so I know what women want, we've put in thousands and thousands of hours with women like all of you to build this. Put, put together a full investing plan. It's completely free. You can save it. You can come back. You can change it. It'll cost you more than 1000 bucks if you put that together with another or a Wall Street firm. Um, and then send me an email and tell me what you loved about it, what you didn't like about it, et cetera. Because again, you know, the, the way I think I can help is this gender investing gap is costing the women in this room hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over the course of their lives. And that is take jo this job and shove it money. It's leaving an abusive relationship money. It's buying the beach house money, right? These are not small amounts of money. And that doesn't mean put all your money in and what if the market crashes tomorrow? We advocate a, an investing over time approach so that you can ride out the ups and downs of the Trump administration <laughs> while <laughs> investing. Uh, but I think supporting each other through this, helping each other grow these businesses, um, as the guys have done for forever. You know, we can wait for them to get it, and many of them will. Um, but I've been waiting too long, so I'm doing something different now. I, I think this was just an amazing conversation, and it is very clear there's power in the pack. So thank you all. Oh, I have one more thing. I have one more thing. If y'all go in, sorry, one more thing. If you go in, there is a code. If you go in to lfs.com slash dreamforce, you actually, if you open an account, you get $100 put in your account for you. Yeah, how about that? All right, sorry about that, Shelly. Uh, hey, that was a good I want to give away money. Yeah, let's give away some money. But anyways, I do think it is, you know, for me, it is my passion. And the same, I just decided I had to do something. I went from the business of market research to the business of equality by accident and by choice at the same time. So I think it's really important. Thank you very much. This was amazing. <laughs>